Um, I wanted to do, it's probably going to be a, a slightly shorter podcast, but we'll see, you know, we'll see how we go. Talking a little bit about how it might take some emetophobia sufferers potentially a little bit longer or how they might find it potentially a little bit more challenging because the majority of the time we are talking about how straightforward, how predictable and how easy it can be for the majority of emetophobia sufferers to go through the program and overcome their phobia. But are there others out there in the smaller minority that might have a bit, a bit more of a difficult time of things? And if that is the case, why do you think that might be? Hmm. Okay. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, okay, so, so, well, there we've got a podcast. There we way. go. Done. Thank you very much. See you next week. Um, mm. So oh. if, you, if, if, we, if we remind ourselves that mental health is on a continuum, and let's say it goes from zero to 100, and someone who is really on top of their mental health and their mental health is really, really good and they're thriving, might score up in the late 90s or 90 to 100, okay? And people that aren't thriving uh, um, would score lower than that. Let's say, you know, most people that when they start our program score, you know, around 50%, say. Some people can score lower than that. And what that score is, is a score of how well you are managing your your thoughts, your beliefs, the way you process information, experience, your general knowledge, the way you're managing your mental health. Okay, you, you, we need to manage our mental health the same way you manage your diet, the same way you manage your exercise, the same way you manage your sleep, the same way you manage your going to the loo. Okay, mental health thriving is a skill set. Most people don't know that, but it's a skill set. Okay, it's a skill set. And yep. the more yep. that you use that skill set well and you tweak it, the more happy, positive, thriving you are. And if you score up in the late 80s or early 90s on our on our TQ quiz, your mental health will be great and you will not have a metaphobia. It's impossible to have a metaphobia while scoring 90% on our quiz, meaning that if you scored 90% on our quiz, that means you're managing the component parts of your mental health really, really well. And as you move up from, say, 50% to 90% along that line, you're going to overcome any mental health symptoms that are being caused by you not managing your health very well along the way. Okay? As your yep. mental health improves and your skill set gets better and better and better, any little symptoms, not just your metaphobia, but any other associated symptoms are going to kind of disappear into the background as well. And I'll give you an example of that. Some of the comorbid symptoms of a metaphobia are things like OCD and anorexia, for example, or intrusive thoughts. And as you know, if someone comes to us for a metaphobia and they go through the Thrive Programme, our programme, all of those symptoms get better and better and better to the point where they disappear all of them at the same time their self-esteem is improving and their social confidence improving and their sense of power and control is improving and they're learning to process experience and events in a helpful way and generally everything's getting and better and better a high tide raises all ships so all of your mental health issues are going to slowly decrease into the background as you get mentally healthier and more thriving as you're going through the program Okay, yep. so your average emetophobe, and let's say, and I'm just guessing here, your average emetophobe, and let's say that's 75% of the people that we see that come through the program, whether they go through it with a coach or by themselves with just you know, the program itself, um, it doesn't matter, but let's say 75% of them go through as prescribed, as we've talked about, lots of times before okay it, it, it's quite a simple process although they have to put a lot of work in and the training part of it the training program part of it will take them six to eight weeks just on that note sorry we often get questions about you know when you say six to eight weeks six to eight weeks six to eight weeks is the training part of it OK, that doesn't yep. mean they have to be over it in six to eight weeks. They are learning mm -hmm. the program. They are learning to manage 
their mental health skills and resources during that six to eight weeks. Then they go off and practice and refine that every day until they get better and better and better and they're over their emetophobia, right? So that doesn't mean we expect or even want them to be over it in six to eight weeks. Many people are because, of course, their mental health improves dramatically as they're going through the programme, but actually we don't expect that. The programme, the training element, you can train me how to do my couch to 5K in six to eight weeks, but I need to keep running and refining it and getting better and better every day until I can do that. So the training part is six yep. weeks. So um, just sorry, Rob, just a button. I think that that is bringing that up is, is a really important point. It's it's definitely a narrative or a topic of conversation that I get a lot, especially in my practice, where they tend to put a lot a lot of pressure on themselves to be completely over, completely 100% cured by the end of the six to eight weeks. And like you say, some people are completely over it by six to eight weeks. But if you're not, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get over it. And you should know by that point exactly what you need to do in order to get yourself across the finishing line, right? Yeah. The, diff the difficulty is, Joe, as you know, as, as all of our listeners know, being a perfectionist is a major part of the problem for most, if not all, emetophobes. So whether we said two weeks or whether we said six months or ten years, they would still put themselves under massive pressure. The problem isn't yes. yep. that we say six to eight weeks. The problem is they put themselves under massive pressure. Okay, but it's three months of the same thing. We do want them, you know, it's desirable, it's easier for them to apply the program from the moment they start robustly every day until they're cured over it and thriving. Okay. So if, you know, generally speaking, if someone said, Rob, what, what would my aim be? I would say, you know, full steam ahead and, and, and aim to have all the knowledge and be practicing it well within the six to eight weeks. And I would suggest yeah. that probably somewhere, and I am guessing, and I'll, I'll check, somewhere in the region, I think 60 to 75% of emetophobes would report that they're over it within those seven or eight weeks. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because they've always assumed that what we meant was you're supposed to be completely over it. You know, we say that, we say that the vast majority are, which they are, um, but that doesn't mean that's what you have to do. And it would be silly to put pressure on yourself to achieve that because the moment you put pressure on, the moment you allow your desire for control and your perfection to come in, you're doing two things that are actually causing your phobia in the first place. So you, you're going yep. one step yep. forward for two steps back. So mm. there is a reason why you want to aim for a, a, a shorter period of time. A, because for the vast majority, it is doable within that time. And B, if you don't, it's much harder to to remain focused and putting effort in every day if you said it was six months. Because you, you can't yes. do that for yeah. six months. I've been doing my couch to 5K, as you know, right? And it's easy to do it every day for the first two weeks. But after that, things get in the way and blah, blah, blah. And actually, if you have, let's say, five days off, from your learning to thrive and you're putting effort in, you could set yourself back three weeks by taking that week off. If you take one day off yep. and allow yourself to have a real blip one day because you're not putting effort in, you think, oh, what the hell? I'm not going to put effort in. I'm having a day off. You might set yourself back three or four days. So if you are focused and determined over a period of time, the shorter that period of time the more motivated you are, the more effort you put in. So it's easier for people to overcome it in eight weeks than it is uh, 12 weeks, say. But only because mm. the person that's doing it for 12 weeks probably isn't putting in the same amount of effort each day as the person that does it in eight because it's easier to stay focused for eight weeks than it is for 12. Yes. Okay. Yep. To answer your question, though, yes, uh, there are plenty of things that can make it harder and more protracted for someone to overcome a metaphobia and i'll break it into mm. two areas one is i i i don't think it would be fair to say 
the, there's much difference in how long it takes you to overcome your metaphobia with the program if kind of all you've got is a metaphobia. Okay, so if someone who is absolutely reclusive, uh, a metaphobe, um, and has it and has it really, 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 really bad, as opposed to someone that just has it really bad, because there's no light version, is there? There's no ease. Oh, I've got a little yeah. bit of metaphobia. You know, everyone's got it. Okay, I don't think there's much different for those people. I don't think the severity of their metaphobia dictates how long it's going to be. A metaphobia is just a metaphobia. But if you've yeah. got metaphobia yeah, yep. and you've got OCD and you've got anorexia. You know, a significantly higher number of your everyday thoughts and beliefs are going to be unhelpful mm. and going to be misdirecting you and causing you hurdles and causing you problems. You haven't just got your emetophobia worries and, and cognitions and anxious thoughts. You've also got your anorexia ones. OK, you and I were mm. talking before that you pretty much at normally, even when you were in a met, right? If you had anorexia mm, as well, yeah. you wouldn't be. If you had OCD mm. as well, that's further complication. So you've just got more work to do. If you've got more work to yep. do, then it's probably going to take you longer than the person that just has a metaphobia. Yes. But in the same way as if you're going through, you, pardon me, you lost a loved one recently or a friend recently. Mm, I did, yep. Okay, so let's say we're talking now two months ago. And let's say also mm. you're going through a very stressful divorce and also it's still in the middle yep. of lockdown, okay? You mm. are going to find that harder, okay? Even if it's just finding it harder to put the daily effort in than right now if you were lying on a beach yep. in, in oh, yeah. the Bahamas oh, sipping yeah. margaritas, yes. right? Yep. So the pressures yeah. and yeah. hurdles yeah. of everyday life for a sufferer is obviously also going to impact how hard they're going to find it and how much effort they're going to have to put in. Because if you're feeling already quite low because you've recently lost a friend, you've got to resolve that whilst you're doing everything else. And that just obviously, mm, that's just yeah. more weight, more pressure, more hurdles, more effort involved, possibly even a longer period involved. But again, yeah. that shouldn't matter uh, uh, to an emetophobe because they're still on the same, they're still on that road from Cambridge to London. They're still on the same journey. They haven't got any more. You've still got to challenge those 50 beliefs in your TQ statement. You still only got the mm. 10 or 11 unhelpful thinking styles. There's not more stuff for you to do. It's the same stuff. There might just be more of it. Okay. Yes. So that's, yep. that, those are a couple of areas, right? So emetophobes need to give themselves some slack, cut themselves some slack. If they've got, more than just a metaphobia, even if they've got a metaphobia and their favorite friend died recently, that's going to make it harder for them, right? Or they're going through yeah. some exams, that's going to make it harder for them. Of course, those things are going to make it harder. Um, mm. But the program's still the same for them. The other uh, situations would be that, um, and, and as you know, we had an email uh, today about this from a lovely lady in Romania called Oana. And she was asking about the fact that she's got a physical illness that also affects her ability to eat. I think she has something like gastritis or something. And so she's quite often nauseous all day. Mm. And that, of course, is going to be a massive burden to an emetophobe, having those yep. thoughts and feelings to continually fight. Her question was, can I still do it? Can I still overcome it and learn to thrive? I think we've answered that already. Yes, mm. yes you can although exactly. yes you're probably going to find it it requires more effort and possibly over a longer period because you've got more work to do that's kind of all yeah but also um, in, in, in terms of feeling nauseous we know that a lot of emetophobes feel sick a lot of the time and mm. that only you know that that horrible that kind of spiral, that self-fulfilling, self-completing circle only makes it harder for them because by by the fact that sometimes it's because they're not eating very much or they're not eating very well, sometimes it's the fact that they're just so anxious all day long because of the thoughts mm. they're having all day long, they're making themselves feel anxious and nauseous by the way they think, but they don't process it that way. 
they don't realize I'm only feeling this way because I'm feeling anxious all the time. They think it's because they might be sick, which of course yep. Yep. adds a massive burden. You were one of those, if I remember correctly, didn't you? Have nausea? I was, away? yeah. So, and, and I just sort of wanted to add is I can genuinely see every single emetophobia sufferers light bulbs pinging off as you talked about um the lady who wrote in about her gastroenteritis um pinging off and going, to, sorry well, that's it that's she it. wasn't being ill yep yeah 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 um or her whatever her, her actual diagnosed physical stomach problems were right yeah pinging off and going oh well if she's got that and that's why she's feeling nauseous every day that must be what i've got right and i would really just like to um raise awareness to the point that almost every single emetophobic client I see feels nauseous all day, every day, and almost none of them actually have a physical problem wrong with them. And, you know, to highlight that even further, I myself, when I had emetophobia, felt sick all day, every day. And it was by far and a mile the most unpleasant part of being emetophobic. And I even spent about it was about six, six, 700 pounds on a MRI. I, I wanted to go privately because I wanted to have it done as quickly as possible um, because I wanted to know what was wrong with my stomach because I didn't want to feel nauseous every day. And I thought there absolutely must be a reason as to why I'm feeling this sick this often. And the MRI came back and there was absolutely nothing wrong with me. There was no further test they could have done. They said, listen, Joe, there is nothing wrong with your stomach. It has to be psychological, you know, and then fortunately going through the private, Thrive program, I was able to get on top of it and I don't feel nauseous at all, really, no more than the next person that doesn't have emetophobia anymore. So I just, I wanted to, to raise awareness at that point because I don't want anyone that is listening to this that has emetophobia to feel even more powerless about their ability to get on top of what is arguably the most challenging symptom that they are living with along with their emetophobia. For the most part, it is something that unintentionally you're doing to yourself and you can absolutely yeah. get rid of it by getting on top of your emetophobia. I did look, I did look at those uh, uh, feedback forms earlier before I knew we were going to talk about this today. And mm. I didn't see in any one of them, someone saying, actually my, my physical symptoms of nausea stayed after I'd stopped after I overcame my emetophobia. Yeah, I've never seen it. Not in my practice. I've, no, never I've, I've never, I've never, I've never heard that either. Obviously, for mm. Awana, um, yeah, if she, if she's got something go, I mean, I still doubt it. I mean, the chances are mm. that that you know she has this gastritis, whatever it is, as a, as a, as a yeah. symptom of her emetophobia, right? So it's likely that when she's yeah. eating well and everything else, once she's over it, mm. that will go as well. Mm. But I, but it yeah. would definitely be. A significant hurdle, a significant mm. burden, not hurdle, a significant burden for mm. her going through it. Because yep. the one thing yep. you're trying to defeat is your horrible thoughts about vomiting. And here you are thinking about mm. it all day, every day. The one thing yep. I would also yep. add to it is people, uh, uh, sufferers have to be careful that they don't legitimize their phobia because of their um physical experiences they're having mm. yeah so so yeah. when you were going through the program for example if you're having these horrible thoughts and feelings every day obviously it's harder for you then to mm. if you believe there's there's a there's a physiological root cause to that to those experiences yes. which i did for a really which, long time which you yep. did it's going to be even harder for you then to get the motivation up because you'll be thinking what's the point you know, yeah. if I yes. ever get over yep. this, I'm still going to feel horrible. I'm still going to feel like this. Yep. But that's, of course, how everyone um, And feels. sorry, Rob, just, just to add to that point as well, just on top of it, really, to, to build some base in this, another physical symptom that I was very much bringing onto myself through my thinking was lightheadedness, right? I felt really dizzy a lot of the time, especially in the build-up to doing things that I was, you know, creating anxiety about. And I even went to the doctor's, and they diagnosed me with, uh, it was something to do with the inner ear crystals that um, help, you know, with your stability. And I can't, I can't remember the medical name now, but that straight away legitimized that there was something actually wrong with me. 
and then of course propagated how powerless I felt to get on top of it. Now, not, you know, no coincidence that after I got thriving, after I got over my symptoms, I stopped feeling dizzy every day. So it could have been very easy for me to listen to what the doctor was saying, the, the authority figure, and feel very, very powerless to overcoming how dizzy I was making myself feel all the time. And of course, what I'm not saying is that the, the, the doctor is always feeding you wrong information. Of course not. But it is just something to be aware of, especially when it comes to very common and reoccurring physical symptoms that a lot of emetophobia sufferers and generally anyone that is in a difficult mental health position can be inflicting upon themselves. One final point on that, because it fits in well with the next mm. podcast we're going to record straight after this one. And that is, um, so who are going to, what people, which people are going to find it hardest, which people are going to have mm. to put the most amount of work in, those would be the people, in all probability, not with the physical symptoms, not with um, a, a medical reason for feeling nauseous every day, but the people that are going to find it hardest are the people who have backed out of life and living more than the next person. So when we see people yes. that are basically that have locked themselves in their house for 10 years and haven't left their house and aren't mm. working and aren't socialising and are reclusive and, and don't do anything. Basically what they're doing, and we understand why, basically what they're doing though is they've given up all of their coping skills and just gone into full avoidance mode. They're avoiding working, yep. they're avoiding people, they're avoiding eating, they're avoiding leaving the house. They've, they've opted for comfort over over everything else so whatever coping skills they originally had when their metaphobia first started they've basically lost mm. now or given away or, or yep. you know you know they've got unfit if you like and so they mm. are the people that have got the most work to do because they're they're, yep. they're not they're, they're they're not living normal lives and they've just got to overcome mm. their metaphobia like the average person is right we know that most most people the metaphobia are are bright driven motivated middle class people mostly women that are are very successful in every other area of their lives right yep but if you've completely locked yourself away or you're hiding away or you've got parents or friends that collude with you that allow you to do that then basically you're you're quite a powerful person you've got a lot of mm. power but the only power you have is to avoid you feel yep. quite powerful because you're 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 quite clever in that respect because you've managed mm. to find a way of totally avoiding any situation in life that might make you feel nauseous or possibly be sick but actually you're not living your life though mm. so those people have got more work to do because they just need to start getting back into life and learning basic coping yeah. skills before yeah. they can yeah. then you know, really work at that and, and move forward and learn to thrive properly. But we're going to talk about that a bit later on, I think. Yes, yeah, it'll, it'll be a, a really good... And a, a way that I want to start that podcast up is talking about a, a, a few clients that I have taken through and one in particular that I am taking through at the moment who's struggling with agoraphobia and emetophobia at the same time and very much is just keeping themselves within the house okay. and not doing anything at all. Um, okay. So that'll be a, a really good discussion around coping skills and managing uncomfortable emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Just to end, okay. to end on this one. Covers everything from my end. For, good. For just to end Sorry, on mate. that. What was that? Um, yep. so, so just to reiterate, it, 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 in terms of your ability to overcome metaphobia, it doesn't mm. matter, in inverted commas, what other symptoms you have, what other issues there are, yep. whether whether you've got cancer, whether you, whether you, uh, uh, you know, going through a, a very stressful divorce or there's a lot of stress and anxiety or you're living in a war zone or something else, right? The program is still the same. You still have to do exactly the same thing, mm. but it might require more effort on your part to do them because you've got a, a lot of stress in your life, or it might mean you have to do it a slightly different way. You might have to put lots of effort into learn to manage that stress better, first of all, 
before you then start to yep. really apply the program in relation to retrophobia. But it's still the same program yep. and it will still work. Yep, cool. Fantastic.